Hello, and welcome to the Data Engineering Podcast, the show about modern data management. When you're ready to build your next pipeline or want to test out the projects you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so check out our friends over at Linode. With 200 gigabit private networking, scalable shared block storage, and a 40 gigabit public network, you've got everything you need to run a fast, reliable, and bulletproof data platform. If you need global distribution, they've got that covered too, with worldwide data centers, including new ones in Toronto and Mumbai. And for your machine learning workloads, they just announced dedicated CPU instances, and they've got GPU instances as well. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Linode, that's L-I-N-O-D-E, today to get a $20 credit and launch a new server in under a minute. And don't forget to thank them for their continued support of this show. And you listen to this show to learn and stay up to date with what's happening in databases, streaming platforms, big data, and everything else you need to know about modern data management. For even more opportunities to meet, listen, and learn from your peers, you don't want to miss out on this year's conference season. We have partnered with organizations such as O'Reilly Media, Corinium Global Intelligence, ODSC, and Data Council. Upcoming events include the Software Architecture Conference, the Strata Data Conference, and PyCon US. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash conferences to learn more about these and other events and take advantage of our partner discounts to save money when you register today. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Tom Plagg and Greg Mundy about BrightHive, a platform for building data trusts. So, Tom, can you start by introducing yourself? Sure. Hi. My name is Tom Plaggy. I uh, came to BrightHive uh, around about the time it formed, actually. Myself and the CEO, Matt Gee, uh, had been working together at the University of Chicago and then had been doing some consulting work. And uh, so as we were uh, creating Bright Hive, I was working for another data science startup and was convinced by, uh, by Matt and by the vision that he put forward to come over and lead the product and engineering team here. And Greg, how about yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Greg Mundy. Um, I come to Bright Hive um, after previously working as a government contractor um, for a local company here in West Virginia uh, for a few years. Uh, most of the work that I'd done was actually focused in data management. So I got involved with BrightHive mainly from some of the work that they did out of the Workforce um, Data Initiative in Chicago. Uh, so it was really nice to come to a company that I could leverage a lot of the experience that I had for data management, uh, building data pipelines, data systems in a very, very interesting company. And Tom, do you remember how you first got involved in the area of data management? Sure. So I came to Chicago, where I currently live, uh, in about 2009. And I was uh, was actually a, a postdoc in astrophysics. So I was working with uh, pretty decent volumes of data in the experiments that uh, that we were working on. I completed my postdoc and afterwards uh, started looking at faculty jobs and decided that wasn't the route that I wanted to take. So uh, I, I kind of took advantage of the community that existed at the University of Chicago around uh, data science and, and the social sector. There was a center forming at the University of Chicago as well as a fellowship program uh, called Data Science for Social Good that was spinning up just as my postdoc was ending. And uh, through discussions with the folks who were setting those uh, those new entities up, I kind of realized that that was the route that I wanted to take. And, and of course, coming from an academic background, the skill sets and the technologies are, are a little bit different, but you do kind of get a broad exposure to a lot of different ideas. And so I had some, some learning to do uh, as I switched over, uh, both about the technology and about the needs of the organizations that uh, that we were working with, largely nonprofits and uh, government agencies. But that's that's kind of how I got started. We uh, we started trying to do pure data science, machine learning work, and then and from there realized that a lot of these social sector agencies actually had needs in data management and data engineering just as much as they did analytics, if not more so. Um, and so I, I started learning about the field and and uh, and building my expertise there. And Greg, do you remember how you first got involved in the area of data management? Yeah, I think I, I like to say I came into the field somewhat by accident. Uh, in grad school, I spent a lot of time doing, um, well, data mining at the time. So a lot of knowledge engineering, machine learning. Then when I got into industry, I, sp- I actually spent some time as faculty for a few years. And then I got into a company where we were doing a lot of work with data from NASA and NOAA. Then eventually I shifted in that same company over to a project 
that was doing large scale data archival for um, NOAA scientific data sets. So after spending a few years in that sector and really developing a lot of the skills of you know managing these large scale data systems, you know, being able to actually extract useful data from these systems in a timely fashion. It dawned on me after a while that you know the social good of you know being able to take these large volumes of data and actually find ways of doing something that benefits society with it. That's really the thing that got me even more interested in the field. So. When the opportunity to do work um, through data science for social good um, with the Workforce Data Initiative came along as a voluntary thing, I jumped on board because it was more of using the skills that I developed from working on NASA and NOAA data to actually do more in the social sector. And so... At the opening, I mentioned that BrightHive is a platform for building data trusts. And before we get too much into BrightHive specifically, I'm wondering if you can give a bit of a description about what a data trust is and some of the reasons that an organization might want to build one. Sure. A data trust is a, so it's a form that a data collaborative can take. And uh, it's a particular form that has a governance structure attached to it. A trustee, who's generally a, uh, a party who all sides who are sharing data with each other uh, uniformly have faith in as a, as a steward of the data. And it also has a technology backbone as well, so that all of the organizations who are exchanging data amongst themselves are kind of speaking the same language. And it's, it's important to note that a data trust is really appropriate for multi-party data sharing. It's not really for uh, internal collaboration within an enterprise. I think that that problem has largely uh, been addressed by other by other actors in the industry. It's it's when you start to go across agency lines or across public private lines that you really need a lot of the infrastructure and around you know data sharing agreements and and very strict logging and controls over who's using the the data that you are exposing for what purposes. You you need to draw a lot more lines and uh, and introduce a little bit of a different type of technological solution. Um, and, and it's one that we recognized at Bright Hive pretty early on was, was kind of a missing piece in the social sector in particular. Uh, a lot of data sharing agreements that are signed between governments and, and private industry or nonprofits are kind of one-offs, uh, generally used for piloting or for uh, developing one particular set of metrics for reporting. Uh, and then it goes away and uh, the next uh, agency head who comes in kind of has to reinvent it, start over from scratch. So we realized early on when we were working with these types of entities that something more sustainable and ex- ex- uh, extensible would really help the field move forward and, and help build a, a true social sector data infrastructure where people were collaborating uh, to serve the to serve the people who needed their help. And so it was like the match between this particular uh, form of data collaborative, which grew out of actually the intelligence community, uh, and what we saw as the needs of the social sector that, that really was the impetus behind Bright Hive in the first place. And that brings us to Bright Hive specifically. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit more about what Bright Hive is, both as an organization and from the platform perspective. As an organization, uh, we, are a, we are a public benefit corporation. We started out uh, as a consultancy called Impact Lab, and that in turn formed out of the Data Science for Social Good Fellowship that was hosted at the University of Chicago. That fellowship was designed to put largely grad students uh, in uh, computer science and engineering and hard sciences and, and the social sciences uh, to work on machine learning problems that were facing governments and nonprofits. And certain types of problems are amenable to a three month fellowship program, uh, many are not. So as the fellowship grew and expanded to a second and third year, we, we saw the need to take the kinds of problems that weren't amenable to that sort of you know, drop in, drop, uh, drop out type structure and put a little bit more sustained effort into them. Uh, so we created the consultancy and Matt Gee and myself, and as well as Andrew Means uh, were the principals. Uh, and then the three of us uh, spent about a year fleshing out what we saw as the the needs of the sector, and then moved from a consultancy to a product company. Uh, That was when we created Bright Hive and absorbed our old uh, consultancy into it. And 
So uh, it's always been, you know, deep in our DNA is the idea of building data infrastructure with a social purpose, right? That's how we got into this. That's how the three of us started working together. It's right there in our, in our company charter is data collaboration is good overall and more people should do it. But we're particularly interested in solving the problems which address the needs of, let's say, low-income individuals who are, who are trying to get education and jobs. We've, we've worked on problems related to homelessness and other, I'd say, broadly conceived uh, social mission aligned work. And we definitely continue to do so. That, that's really who we are. And you mentioned that a data trust is a specific instance of what you categorize more broadly as a data collaborative. I'm wondering if you can just talk a bit more about some of the other forms that that might take. Yeah, I would say, you know, if you're thinking about multi-party data collaboratives, a lot of times the form that takes, and uh, Western Pennsylvania is a great example of this, uh, is is one particular agency or uh, oftentimes academic group setting up a giant data warehouse and negotiating bilateral data sharing agreements with all the parties who agree to pool their data. Uh, and then they host this single data warehouse. They control access to it. And that's actually a really good model if you can get everybody to agree to it. And if there's sustaining funding available and all sorts of other, you know, many things can go wrong, but uh, but certainly it's worked quite well in Western Pennsylvania. I would say the thing that makes a data trust a bit different is even though there is a trustee and a centralized governance function within a data trust, it's really intended to be multilateral rather than a set of bilateral agreements. The idea is that you have N members of your data trust, let's say a Department of Higher Education, a workforce uh, workforce board, um, maybe some large employers. Each of them exposes to the others the metadata about the data sets that they're willing to share. Each of them can ask for or publish particular data sets uh, to other members, not necessarily all other members. And the members together can decide on on metrics and calculations that can be performed on their administrative data to produce, let's say, aggregate metrics or anonymized data sets for use by analysts, which truly do pool their data, deduplicate, create new entities, and you know produce a data product that's really owned by the trust collectively. Um, so that's the distinction that we draw. We don't really have a centralized warehousing structure. We really more have peer-to-peer API-based uh, data sharing and a set of microservices that uh, that control access to it and log and, and manage all of the uh, the compliance requirements, which can sometimes be quite extensive. And so I think that's what makes it different it, than uh, than a data collaborative of the sort that, let's say, uh, here in Chicago exists uh, around the data from the Chicago public school system. That's managed by Chapin Hall, and and they are in charge of it, and everybody works through them. Our goal is not to make that obsolete, but to allow for situations where there isn't an entity that can serve that role to still have a way that they can practically uh, work together using data. And one of the things that you mentioned there that I'm interested in digging more into is this idea of the ownership of the derivative data sets or aggregate information about the different entities contained within the data owned by the different members of the trust and some of the complications that arise in terms of where the intellectual property would lie as far as any algorithms or derivative data products that come out of the uh, information that's available in this trust. Yeah, let me break that into two parts. First, the algorithms. Because of the space that we're operating in, we take a pretty opinionated stance that, especially if public sector is involved, the algorithms themselves that are being used to create, let's say, metrics or uh, or scores or, or any sort of other derivative data products, even if the underlying data for privacy or intellectual property reasons is... is uh, kept under lock and key, that the algorithms uh, themselves ought to really be made public, if at all possible. So our stance on this is, you know, publish your code, basically. But, you know, not, that's, that's not going to work in every circumstance. There's, there's obviously exceptions to every rule, but it's our, uh, it's our conviction that that's kind of the right path forward for uh, social sector organizations, for philanthropy, and, uh, and for public, public organizations. But in terms of the data itself, I think you raise probably the single most important point, and the, in, in a sense, the purpose of the data trust is to create a, 
and and have every party sign a data trust agreement, which which strictly lays those conditions out, and also sets up a structure where each of the organizations sends in a representative and talks through things like, oh, we'd like to create this new combined data set, or we'd like to publish this particular metric. It requires data from you, you, and you. Let's uh, let's all work together and figure out how to do it. And then the, uh, the data product is then owned by the trust and with the trustee as the custodian of it. And, you know, it, it's a structure that I think is not, at least at this point, one that runs on autopilot. So BrightHive, in addition to having a product and engineering team, has a pretty strong services component that helps organizations think this all through, work through the, the data trust agreement and the legalities Compliance aspects to get to the point where they're able to uh, make those decisions collectively and implement them in code. It may be one day when everybody knows what a data trust is and there's 100 templates to work from, it will be possible for a data trust or for a group of, of agencies to come together and build this type of collaborative without some handholding, some guidance. Uh, but we're not there yet. And so each of the data trusts that we're working with has what we call a data trust lead assigned to it, whose job it is to help make those connections and to talk with both executive level folks as well as the technological, the IT teams, and kind of bring this to fruition. Because in addition to just the practicalities of how do I calculate this metric or how do I implement this scoring algorithm, you have to get buy-in from everybody. You have to get everybody to sign off that the intellectual property is is uh, is owned by this new thing. And that's, uh, that's a very non-trivial task. And for an existing data trust that's already been established, have you found that there are general approaches to how an individual or an organization might gain access to be either a member of the trust or be able to have some limited access to the data contained therein to be able to do some sort of analysis or build additional products on top of it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the data trusts, actually uh, a couple of them that we have, uh, came together explicitly in order to allow a third-party software developer to implement an application that uses the data uh, within the trust. And in that case, it's a matter of basically standing up the OAuth service that uh, and creating uh, API keys and making sure that that particular third-party developer has has access to the data, but also that every access is logged, that a full audit trail is kept. And that's kind of what we designed our initial version of this around, was the scenario where the main user of the data within a data trust was to be uh, third-party app developers or third-party analysts who would be accessing the data via API. I think what we've come to appreciate is that there's many scenarios in which uh, it actually makes more sense for a, a big data user to actually just join the data trust formally, in which case there's uh, there's actually the way that the governance structure is set up within the data trust agreement. There's pretty you know well thought through and, and explicit rules for how one becomes a part of the trust and how one's membership is approved. Now, if you're if you're a member, that's great. It makes it easier because you are able to participate in the governance and uh, the decision making process around what data becomes available and how you can use it. But certainly, we'll continue to build around this notion of, of third party access as well. And uh, there, you know, as long as you have RESTful APIs stood up and a, and a good authentication and authorization system behind it, I think there's there's a lot of existing technology that can be brought to bear on, on solving the particular problem of access control. So going. More more into the technical aspects of BrightHive, I'm wondering if you can talk through the existing architecture of how you manage the overall storage and access and governance of these data trusts and some of the ways that that evolution has evolved as you've had different use cases put forth and worked with different organizations to be able to meet that you're meeting all of their needs while being able to have a maintainable and sustainable architecture that you can build from. So at the very core... We took the tech very early on to use the microservices architecture style as the way of evolving our software, of creating and evolving our software. The reason for that was very early on, we realized, you know, we want to use services like AWS. We want to be able to use services like Google Cloud. But we also recognized that there was a lot of cases that users would come to us and they would say, well okay, it's great that your infrastructure runs on these cloud providers, but we also want to have this software running in on our infrastructure in-house. That way we have more control over it. So by leveraging the microservices architecture style, uh, using Docker containers um, exclusively to build most of our infrastructure, 
we've created a platform that scales very well, but also supports those needs of being able to run in different kinds of environments. For the typical data trusts that we've developed, the ones that we are actively managing ourselves, most of those data trusts currently reside on Amazon Web Services. We use a lot of industry standard tools such as Terraform for establishing the networking and the the basic infrastructure needed to run the data trust to manage these containers that I mentioned that make up the various components of the data trust. We use services like Kubernetes to do the container orchestration management, etc. Internally, our software, we use a lot of Python in-house, but you know we also make use of other languages, including JavaScript, Golang, and so on for some of the work that we that we do that's not necessarily core to the data trust. We rely a lot on open source technologies. So for our ETL, we use Airflow and Dagster um, for, for helping us to build out and manage our ETL pipelines. You know, so overall, what our, what our current goal is for 2020, as we've developed this first round of what a data trust looks like, we are now finding ways to streamline a lot of these processes. So, you know, we're getting better with the way we're making use of our microservices. You know, we're getting better at orchestrating our microservices. Um, We're also looking at ways of scaling this a little bit more effectively, like making it a more hands-off type of a data trust where, you know, we can actually dynamically spin up a data trust on demand for an individual user who doesn't necessarily want a large data trust that has a lot of elements to it. You know, they might be in an exploratory stage where they're just trying to get their feet wet with a data trust. So that's really what we're looking for for 2020 with respect to taking the technologies that we currently have and looking at the business needs that we've identified and try to build a more scalable product moving forward. So let me give you a, just one example of of the of what makes the microservice architecture so attractive uh, for the particular types of problems that we're trying to solve. One of our uh, data trusts is specifically set up amongst actually many of them are are generally uh, uh, addressing the problem of talent pipeline management or uh, uh, education to work. And uh, in that scenario, it's it's often the case that individuals who are trying to decide between different opportunities for higher education, uh, whether it's vocational ed or uh, a two-year college degree or a four-year college degree, they're in a scenario where they have a lot of alternatives available to them, but but no data that's helping them make the decision about which might uh, have the, the best return on investment for their particular scenario. And return on investment data is something that, that we've, we've been deeply involved in uh, the thinking around uh, for, for quite some time. Greg mentioned the Workforce Data Initiative that was one of the, the early uh, efforts that led to the creation of BrightHive in the first place. And uh, as well, there's certain regulatory reasons why ROI data is becoming more and more important and relevant to education and uh, workforce organizations. So uh, the issue is, though, that if you actually want to calculate ROI, you, you need access uh, to individual level wage records in most cases. You need to know how much uh, graduates in a particular program are earning, whether they're working in the field that they've been trained in. And, and that sort of data is, as you might imagine, extremely sensitive. Generally, it's housed uh, at state agencies or federal agencies. And the rules surrounding the use of that data are really quite strict, uh, as, as you would hope that they would be. What our early architectural decision to support both you know, the, the big cloud providers, but also uh, uh, hosting certain components of the, of the platform uh, in-house and on-premises, uh, allowed us to do was to uh, work with uh, this particular client to deploy the actual uh, metric calculation, the ROI calculation engine, uh, locally on premises, uh, and nevertheless to be able to take the outputs of it, ingest it into the data trust, and make those uh, available to other members for uh, for use by third party applications and for analysis. And that API uh, connection between the metric calculation engine, which 
uh, which we don't actually, uh, we as BrightHive don't even have the ability to query directly. Uh, we can't find out how much you earned last year. <laughs> Again, it's good. We shouldn't be able to. But the rules surrounding the aggregation, for example, the the limit of the smallest cohort uh, for which you're allowed to uh, calculate means and medians and other aggregate statistics, that's all implemented in code and kept isolated on the on-premise instance. And then we're able to communicate with it securely and get what we need and incorporate the outputs into the data trust without actually having to be in the position of managing this extremely sensitive data set uh, ourselves on a cloud provider. Yeah, the the issue of data privacy is definitely interesting in this context of the data sharing because there are some elements that might be protected and covered in certain regulatory environments of the owner of the data that somebody who is partnering with them in a trust either doesn't have the controls in place for or doesn't have the authorization to access. And so I'm interested in how you approach some of those types of scenarios. For instance, if somebody is covered by HIPAA data and then there's another member of the trust who's providing information about employment and they want to be able to perform some sort of aggregates across those two data sets in either direction, how you handle the aspect of the person with the employment records not having the controls and agreements in place for being able to access some of those HIPAA protected elements, how you ensure that they're still able to be able to gain some value from the trust. Yeah, and, and that's a really important problem, obviously. And it's one that uh, that we're actively working on right now. So I don't want to give the impression that we've solved the secure multi-party computation problem entirely and are, are ready to deploy it for anybody who comes to us with their checkbook open. Uh, so, you know, just uh, <laughs> full transparency here. This is, uh, this is a set of features that we're actively working on and we think we have a conceptual solution to. Apart from the scenario where there is a trusted entity, a, a trustee who does have the ability to access both data sets, in which case the problem is, is much more straightforward. To handle the situation where there are two data sets that need to be combined to produce some metric, but there's no organization with the authorization or the trust relationships uh, to access both, you either need some of the speculative or actively uh, under research secure multi-party computation technologies, or you need to create a jointly uh, governed entity like a data trust, which can uh, execute a, a pipeline, or as we call it internally, a DAG, and uh, be able to take encrypted copies of, of both data sets, decrypt them using using keys uh, to which neither, neither party has access, perform the calculation, destroy the data, return the results, and uh, and we think that we have a pretty good idea around how to do that. And it involves basic, you know, public key encryption of both data sets that are the input, uh, a well-defined input specification for what goes into a particular DAG, and as well as what comes out of it. And then, of course, pretty strict logging and authorization controls around when that DAG is allowed to be run by whom, and uh, keeping track of each run. So it, it's basically like you could imagine spinning up a compute that we as BrightHive, you know, just can't log into. It's just a, a Lambda function or, or short-lived EC2 instance, performing the calculations on data that's decrypted uh, and then re-encrypting it, the output for each of the parties who's allowed to access it, and then distributing that through the trust. So that sort of approach where the computation is happening on infrastructure that's, that's owned by the trust, if you will, um, sort of gives everybody involved a measure of control and, uh, and allows not just the access to the data to be logged, but but the access for what purpose to be logged? Like, oh, the data was accessed, but this particular routine was run on it that you can look at, like the code is available, and then the data is destroyed afterwards and the outputs are exposed, I think is, is the kind of scenario that you could imagine working in an environment where everybody trusts each other, sort of, but has really strict compliance requirements that they have to live within uh, and really strict you know, relationships and consent agreements with the the people whose data is actually being affected that they that they are worried about uh, for from a number of different obvious perspectives public relations and privacy breaches and everything else like we, we have to reassure everybody involved that they have a, a high degree of control over what's happening and that all the i's are dotted and all the t's are crossed in terms of compliance and that uh, everything is uh, obviously uh, encrypted and handled appropriately according with best practices. And, and we think a trust is a good environment in which to, to meet all those requirements. 
and then somewhat tangential to the idea of privacy and some of the issues of regulation around that is the idea of ethical uses of the data, which is something that is very subjective and hard to define specifically using technical guards. And I know that you have some approaches in the legal frameworks that you put forth as to how to identify some of the guidelines of how to make sure that you're using ethical practices in these data analyses. And another element of that is issues pertaining to bias that exists both in the source data and the algorithms that are used to process it. And I'm wondering what your involvement is with the members of the trust to help them identify ethical best practices and ensure that the ways that they're using the data and processing it and uh, trying to counteract bias in the source sets is up to the sort of current industry best practices uh, and any issues or advice that you have along those lines. Yeah, this is so important. And it, it's really, again, like uh, it, it's in our DNA to care a lot about this. And it's driv- It's actually driven our, our decisions largely around how we grow and who we work with. Um, the, the idea of a data trust is broadly applicable. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, it grew out of the intelligence community, uh, which is an area that we're not working in. But even though the idea is broadly applicable and the software we've written is, I think, appropriate in a lot of different contexts, we've limited our work so far and the clients that we've taken on largely to the education to work domain, which is one that we understand very well. We have a lot of folks on staff with deep subject matter expertise who have the ability to to look at the particular problems that are that the data trusts are trying to solve identify potential issues of bias uh, or uh, some sort of other ethical issue that might arise and actually bring their own expertise to bear on it uh, or at least to be able to issue spot and get questions that might arise up to the governance committee to deal with uh, it, because we've circumscribed the realm in which we're working with our early clients uh, I think that that has given us a lot of comfort that we're working with these early clients very closely and we know what they're doing and why have the in-house expertise to be able to spot uh, potential issues. As we grow as a company and as we move beyond the education to work domain, I think this is, it's a harder problem to solve unless you want to basically staff up in, in every single domain that may exist. If we were to move in to healthcare, for example, would we have to go out and hire folks who have been working in, in healthcare IT or in, in actual healthcare practice uh, long enough to be able to you know, be able to issue spot with the same sort of rigor that we're able to in the domain that we currently work in. And I, I think the goal is that as we move on as a company to that to that place where we're working across a bunch of different domains, that we wouldn't have to necessarily, but we probably would continue to offer that as part of our services offering uh, in a lot of different scenarios. So it, it's a combination of making sure that we're staffed to handle the trickiest bits. Like if we if we start working with health data, having somebody in house, at least one person who is able to weigh in on those issues and spot them. But then also as as we're building out the software, to be able to use tools like Macy, AWS Macy, and and others to bring some machine learning to bear on this as well. To be able to at least flag potential issues like, oh, it looks like this is a gender field. Are are you uh, are you accounting for the fact that gender can change for some individuals or that they're, you know, this shouldn't, shouldn't be stored as a binary or, oh, hey, it looks like this is a social security number. Are you sure you want to publish this? Things like that can be flagged in an automated way. I don't think it's, I don't think it's sufficient to just rely on automated flagging, which is part of why a governance structure exists in a data trust. You would hope that the decision to publish a particular data resource, if it's being reviewed by, by multiple parties who are contributing data to it, that, that, that review process would highlight a lot of these issues. But but given that the data trust idea is new to a lot of folks and the governance structures that we're setting up are still new, uh, we do feel like it's incumbent upon us as as a vendor to keep our own human eyes on a lot of what's happening so that while we're in the process of automating some of these, these ethical controls, we have highly trained individuals who are helping us uh, guide us along that path. Yeah, and I also say too that we have um, security consultants that are external to our company that we do work a lot with. So oftentimes, especially on the technical, and as we're making certain technical decisions, certain architectural decisions, we do consult with um, our security team to make sure that these decisions are in line with the best interest of protecting the data of the users that we're interested with. 
And then another element of the concept of the data trust is that the organizations that are coming into the trust and sharing their data obviously need to have some sort of technical capacity for being able to maintain their end of the system as far as storing the source data sets, securing it in their own means, updating them according to whatever frequency they need to to make sure that the data is fresh and that it's valuable to every member of the trust. And I'm wondering what you have seen as far as some of the common needs on their end as far as being able to participate in the trust or any challenges that they have as far as fulfilling the technical aspects of being able to be a member and ensure that they have sufficient uptime and availability and accuracy in their source data. Yeah, this, there's so much variance, especially if you imagine working with nonprofits, uh, foundations, and, and government agencies. You can about imagine the, the huge variety of, of structures that exist and database, legacy database systems and, and uh, it, internal technical staffing models. And it's always the biggest challenge is if you have three organizations who've never shared data with one another before, they each have different cultures around data, around the way that they share it, the way that they manage it, the way that they keep it updated. And that that culture shock that happens when you throw the three of them into the same room together uh, is something that, that again, we, we rely on humans to actively manage at this point. I would say that in general, our assumption going into this work, which informed our initial thinking around the architecture itself, was that API access to the, the various data resources and, and then automated ETL processes that posted updates to those APIs was uh, was something that would work for, you know, not every data trust member, but but a large subset of them. And as we've gotten into it, I think we've come to appreciate that there's actually another class of actors for whom that's just not, that just is, is a mismatch between the way that they work with data and the way that they, the way that they both report it and use it internally. They'd much rather start from the place of generating a report, uploading an Excel spreadsheet, dealing with flat files. Uh, rather than RESTful APIs. And so we are adding capabilities to our platform that support those kind of users as well, because as you mentioned, the technical capacity issue is one that prevents a lot of data collaboratives from forming or from being sustainable in the first place. And you kind of have to meet the the various members uh, where they are. Uh, you can't necessarily create a data management and data engineering culture uh, from scratch where none exists just for the sake of, of a single collaborative project. You, you really have to build tooling that, that is appropriate for the audience that, that needs to use it. Greg, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think you covered it really well. Um, absolutely, as you say, there's a lot of variance. And we've actually, just as, a, as an organization, we've spent a lot of time for some of our earlier data trusts actually helping them to understand the data that they have in terms of, you know, what the value is, and also being able to help them to building processes to actually help them to extract data into the data trust. So that's been a really big part of some of the really close work that we've been doing with a lot of these agencies lately. Yeah, we've had we've had customers come to us and say that the process of creating a data trust and the process of working with BrightHive has actually caused them to take a step back and and think more think more broadly about the culture of data sharing and data management across the uh, across their uh, various agencies and actually try to to make a a deeper change in the way that they're operating even if it's not necessary just for the sake of the data trust they they feel like they've been able to appreciate all the different approaches that exist out there and with that broader view revisit the way that they're they're handling data internally and that and that's really cool in order to scale this company we won't be able to work with every single customer at the level that we are with our early ones, but it's really rewarding to see those early customers be able to to make those connections and uh, and build on what we're doing uh, in a way that that just sort of spans uh, all the work that they do, whether it's collaborative or not. So true. We, you know, I'll say one time we looking back at a particular customer that we have, seeing them go from this area where it's it was really difficult to get all the data sharing agreements in place to get the players at the table to actually share data with us and seeing that paradigm suddenly shift from yeah it's going to be difficult to get you this data 
to, hey, um, can you add new data that we have into the data trust? You know, that's that that was huge for me. I was like, wow, you know, they've they understood the value of the data trust and what it does for them. Another thing that I'm curious about is the life cycle of these trusts that you're working with and whether they are intended to be short lived and only exist for the duration of a particular project, or if it's something that are generally set up as more of a long term engagement where there is no set termination point and as a corollary to that, I'm curious how you're approaching sustainability of BrightHive itself to ensure that for any of these data trusts that are designed to last in perpetuity, to ensure that you're there for the lifetime of that project as a support mechanism and to make sure that the data trust continues to be viable. To take the first question first, I think a setting up the full governance structure and, the, and getting to the point where everybody can sign off on the data trust agreement is time consuming enough and creates enough new entities, if you will, and new relationships that I think it would probably be overkill for just a quick one-off pilot. I think if you were really just doing something that were strictly time boxed, you wanted to, to try a new approach to a particular problem or, or generate a particular data set for a researcher to look at, you'd probably just sign a one-off data sharing agreement and do the thing and then that's that. The idea behind a data trust is that it is extensible and and uh, governable over the long run, and so sustainability is is I, I think pretty fundamental to the model. The idea being that in in a lot of these cases, agencies who are affecting the same population or uh, philanthropies who are serving populations that are also receiving services from from other related groups, you know, they have a long term need to be able to work together. And providing the venue for them to do so over the long run is, is kind of what we're here for, uh, as opposed to uh, something that's, that's more limited in time and scope. But that does raise the issue of vendor lock-in and the sustainability of BrightHive as a young company. And, and that has driven a lot of our strategy around open sourcing. It, it's, for us, it's a very tactical decision. I'm not a, I'm not a uh, open source fundamentalist, if you will, but, uh, but I am a believer that it, it really does have uh, very important uses. Uh, for businesses, especially young businesses, because it provides the comfort to the clients that if we were to disappear, uh, or if a new competitor were to come along who were, who is offering something that's that's better and more appropriate, well, they own the data. They have uh, access to the core of the code, which would allow them to extract it uh, or even keep the services running. And therefore, it, it reduces the fear in their part that all of a sudden BrightHive disappears and, and their software is no longer supported. Like there is an alternative model where they either internally or uh, or work with one of our partner organizations or some other vendor uh, to make the transition uh, with all the documented source code available to them. And that uh, seems to have helped a lot. And in terms of the types of trust that you've worked with and some of the outcomes of them, I'm curious what you have seen as being the most interesting or innovative or inspirational ways that you have seen the BrightHive platform used, as well as this broader concept of a data trust being leveraged. Uh, I can give one really good example of one of our data trusts. So the data trust that, that I'm going to talk about a little bit does a lot with workforce development. So, you know, a lot of services that they offer to individuals who might be displaced employees, um, they may be veterans, you know, they might be looking for just ways to improve themselves. So, you know, you have this group of agencies that are doing a lot of really good and valuable work, but they don't actually have much insight into just how effective the work is that they're doing. So one of the eye-opening moments for me was after we'd gotten our data trust set up and data started to flow and we had our go live and, you know, they started to get data into the data trust and there was analysis done and um, data being used in these third-party dashboards and applications. And I'm sitting in a meeting and one of the individuals who is in charge looks at us and says, wow, you know, for the first time, we're actually able to see trends in things, just, you know, things that might not be very interesting to the wider population, but 
you know, here we're seeing this trend where individuals are coming into our service centers between these two hours and, or we're seeing more applications for services at two in the morning, for instance. So just, you know, the, the mere fact that they're suddenly unlocking the power of their data to gain insight that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to gain, it, it made all the difference in the world for me. And it really was the thing that cemented the reason why I do what I do at Bright Hive. Tom, do you have anything to add? I think one of the most fun things about working here is actually going to these government these uh, governance meetings and and seeing the folks who are contributing data to the trust and consuming data from it have these have these really generative moments of oh hey we have these data in in the trust we could do these thousand other things and to see the see the wheels start turning right we we've been doing this now uh, with most of our customers for months not years but to see those light bulbs come on and to to hear people talk about the ways that they want to be able to use this trust and, and the data that they're putting into it three years from now to do something totally transformative. The fact that people are approaching data collaborative with that sort of spirit of generating new ideas and generating uh, innovation in the way that services are delivered uh, that's a it's a weird venue for it in some ways, right? Usually, data should be supporting that kind of innovation, but not you wouldn't necessarily always think it would be driving it. And yet, being able to actually look at outcomes, being able to look at the way that services are being delivered to individuals from a number of different directions, seems to open people's eyes in a way and make them step back and think about the bigger picture. That it's really conducive to making new connections and and coming up with new ideas. And so, you know, I, I have some some examples that I could refer to that have happened already. But what I'm really excited about is as these trust relationships between the members of, of, our, uh, of our data trust solidify, and as these new ideas keep coming up, uh, I think we'll, we'll actually see some pretty meaningful transformations in the way that services are delivered to, to individuals who are uh, just entering the job market for the first time. Uh, as agencies who've just never worked together seriously in the past start to collaborate uh, at, at an individual level and track their referrals and whether they're working or not and understand the the various barriers to employment in a truly robust sense where it's not just, oh, this person needs a college degree, but maybe also this person doesn't have a car and needs a way to get to their work or is struggling with a mental health problem. To To take that sort of holistic approach to case management and to see an individual who a case manager may have been working with for two years uh, but never really understood the core of what was causing them uh, to to not be able to take the step that they wanted to take. Uh, that's that's really cool. Like it it it's I think potentially transformative. So I'm looking forward to seeing that materialize over the next months and years. And as we look forward into the future of Bright Hive and the future of how data cooperatives and data trusts are being used as data continues to be central to almost everything we do, I'm wondering what you have planned and some of the trends that you foresee as we move forward. I think one of the big trends that we're going to see is is one that we're already preparing for, which is the expansion of these data collaboratives beyond particular subject matters, let's say, or silos. Because obviously, uh, education to work already includes a number of different stakeholders. It includes public and private education providers, it includes software boot camps, it includes employers, K-12. It's already a pretty large community. But as I mentioned before, you, you, we understand that barriers to employment go way, way, way beyond that. And there's so much curiosity and, and openness to this notion of kind of whole person care, if you will, now uh, that's emerged out of, of research and discussions over the past, uh, I would say, decade or so. Seeing that come to fruition and seeing agencies and philanthropies who are working on seemingly disparate subject matters make connections between them and, uh, and be able to make better decisions and, and drive people in, in better directions based on something that's happening in a place that's kind of in another silo or another part of the state government altogether that we may just never thought about much before, is I think something that's going to happen. It's coming from the top down as well as the bottom, where uh, folks who are working within these agencies are getting curious about it and, and pushing, their, uh, pushing their bosses to, to, uh, to take that next step. And also where 
political appointees and agency heads are coming in and saying, hey, we need an actual data strategy. And, and I think those two forces pushing at the problem from either end is, is leading to the, uh, the expansion of people's idea of what's possible in terms of collaborating with data. So that's thing one. And I would say thing two is this notion of, of sustainable data governance. Um, to me, this is the biggest problem that is, is yet to really be solved with technology in the realm of uh, data engineering uh, is, okay, you can build within a single enterprise, uh, enterprise, you know, a data bus, a, a set of, of tools for collaborating around data. But once you go beyond a single chain of command and involve a bunch of different stakeholders who are coming at it on a, basically a level playing field where everybody needs to agree and sign off on a decision before it's made, uh, I don't think there's great technological support for those types of organizations right now and and for the ongoing support, governance, and maintenance of those relationships once they're established for a given purpose. So I see, first of all, the demand uh, for this type of arrangement uh, continuing to grow. And then second of all, the, the technical space for, for software tooling to kind of solve that real problem that's preventing those those relationships from being sustainable and, and, and really productive. Are there any other aspects of the work that you're doing at Bright Hive or the concept of data trusts and data collaboratives or any of the engineering efforts that you're involved with that we didn't discuss yet that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? I think, no, I think we did. We pretty much covered the bulk of what um, what's sort of on the Bright Hive horizon. So I, f I feel pretty good. I will say though that one thing that's sort of a that was sort of an eye opener for me over maybe the last six months is just as pe people are becoming so much more aware of privacy and especially privacy of their own data. And it's not just necessarily the sort of data elite that are thinking in those terms. So I see that as society in general starts to think more carefully about the data that it's actually sharing. I see this concept of a data trust actually becoming even more and more widespread than it currently is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and dream, driven in part by regulations too, right? The CCPA, the GDPR, like all those four-letter acronyms. I, I don't think that's the end of the story around data privacy regulations. I think it's just the beginning. So not only are consumers starting to ask questions and citizens starting to ask questions about how their data is being used, but their, their representatives are starting to set some, some pretty clear boundaries around it. Not entirely clear to me that a company like Palantir um, is set up in a way that is compatible uh, with some of those controls, and whereas I think a data trust really can be. So it, 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 I, think, I think that the regulatory environment is another thing to keep an eye on, as well as citizen expectations. All right. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch with either of you and follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you each add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And as a final question, I'd like to get your perspective on what you see as being the biggest gap in the tooling or technology that's available for data management today. And I'll start with you, Tom. Well, like I said, I think the biggest, I think that so many of the technical aspects of sharing data uh, actually have a really robust ecosystem around them. I think the the piece that's missing is is being able to to bring all of it together and make it sustainable uh, and manageable by the by the data custodians themselves, uh, as opposed to relying on everybody collectively going and signing up with a single vendor and having a, a uniform uh, IT environment across you know the entire ecosystem. I think is largely impractical, especially in in something like. Uh, the social sector, where there's a whole bunch of different actors. Uh, so to me, that that uh, the the glue that connects uh, data infrastructure provided by multiple vendors and the governance structure that makes it sustainable is is the biggest missing piece right now. If you're a single enterprise with a single decision maker at the top who can say, use this vendor's software, I think you can solve a lot of your data management problems that way. Uh, or if you have a large enough IT staff where you can, you know, take the open source tools that are out there and, and glue them together, I think you can solve the problem that way. Um, but once you start introducing multiple stakeholders into the into the equation, I think the the technical model and the governance model are not standardized yet. Uh, haven't settled on on anything that that's really meeting the needs of the customers. 
And how about you, Greg? Uh, I tend to agree with Tom as well. Honestly, I feel in terms of our technology, we definitely understand a lot about building and sharing data just, you know, out of practice. You know, we've not just Bright Hive, but, you know, as an industry, we've been doing data management for a long time. But again, I think that the ways of automating the legal and governance part of the data trust management is really something that's going to be very important moving forward. You know, as we sort of look at things like blockchain and what it tries to bring to the fore, you know, how do we take some of this knowledge of, th- of say, things like smart contracts and apply them to things like data sharing agreements within a data trust. So I'm really excited to not only see how things like those smart contracts, et cetera, will help to shape our thinking, but I'm also excited to be leading a part of the work that we're actually thinking about this stuff as it applies not only to BrightHive, but also to just data sharing, data trusts in general. All right. Well, thank you both very much for taking the time today to join me and share the work that you're doing at Bright Hive. It's definitely a very interesting area of the overall work being done with data management. And I'm excited to see some of the future work that you do and some of the outcomes of the data trusts that you're helping to build. So thank you both for all of your efforts. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Tobias. You too. Yep. Thanks for having us. listening don't forget to check out our other show podcast.init at pythonpodcast.com to learn about the python language its community and the innovative ways it is being used and visit the site at dataengineeringpodcast.com to subscribe to the show sign up for the mailing list and read the show notes if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show then tell us about it email hosts at dataengineeringpodcast.com with your story and to help other people find the show please leave a review on itunes and tell your friends and coworkers. 